weather's looking beautiful, let's head out for the day. We'll catch a feed of flatties, the good old fashioned way. I know a little place to go, to get some light relief. It's just somewhere between the river and the reef. So you think you'll catch a big one, with all your fancy gear. A day out on the water, with the rods, the reels and beer. If you come home empty handed, your mates will give you grief. But you are still between the river and the reef. Hi folks, welcome to River to Reef. It's a windy old day, I'm about to lose my hat. As Joe Cocker said, keep your hat on. Well, we've got a great program tonight in store for you. Phil Wall, Joel Stoddart, myself and Marty and a few others take you to Cape Jervis in South Australia over near Kangaroo Island and really get onto the big fish. Mad About Boats with Steve Addo. We look at the Southern Star range of boats, they're excellent. And of course, Mark Crockford will explain the ins and outs of marine insurance. A vital that you have marine insurance if you're a boat owner. We've got the Kodak competition, Marine Safety Victoria along, a little subject about buying wooden boats, not what not to do and what to do. It's all on this week's program. Stick around, you'll enjoy it. On Mad About Boats, we're going to be looking at a variety of boats, their purposes, their features, and where their applications may best suit. This week on Married About Boats, we thought we'd get John Barrett back to go through the Southern Star range. They're Australian made, built for Australia, built by Australians, and for our conditions. John, welcome back. Hi it's been Steve. a couple of weeks. It has, yes, good to see you again. Good. Could you tell us a little bit about the Southern Star? Okay, well Southern Star is a, a company that was formerly known as a Southwind that was owned by Yamaha and management bought the company out a few years ago now, Noel Smith, and uh, they've just rebadged them as Southern Star. These are nice boats, I've brought two down today, the 485 and the 525. These are boats that in my opinion just suit Australia and particularly Victorian conditions beautifully. They've just got the right proportions to be fantastic boats. We'll hop aboard shortly and have a look at some of those features. Just on the size of the 485, and the 525, they would fall outside the Victorian life jacket regulations for wearing a life jacket underway? Yes, that's correct. 4.8 is the point where you need to wear a life jacket. Above that size, a life jacket is not required. So both of these boats just get past that measurement point. That should make them very popular. And they both look like very good bay boats. Ideal. Yeah. Some of the features we're going to have a look at, you'll see it start to piece together the things that you should be looking for when you want to find that boat that's right for you. All right. Let's start off with a 525. Okay. Well, this cuddy cab version is quite comfortable, isn't it? This is a great fishing boat. It's one I really like. It's the sort of thing that would, would suit us in, in our Victorian environment. The lovely cockpit freeboard. You've got something to lean up against, and if necessary, your foot can go under that storage tray. You're not tripping up or falling overboard. It does, does make it stable when you're fighting a fish over the side. Very important. The rear seating has removable bases, so you can take those away and we can walk right up to the transom. I notice they're split, so you can just take one out and leave one in. Correct, yes. We've got two nice little compartments on board. Ideal little... for live bait. They're both plumbed up, ready to go. Great. 110 litre underfloor fuel tank, little compartment forward there where we can use as a kill tank or hmm. ice box. And huge side pockets, so you can Plenty store of storage your fishing there. rods. Yep, yes. standard equipment. Standard. Rod holders. Great. The other thing up forward, which we'll have a look at, is we don't have bunk cushions to, to stand on. They've given us a little platform so we can open the hatch, get further forward and stand there and do the anchoring. It's a very convenient way of uh, designing a boat. I like that feature very much. And usually at the front of a boat, that's when it's move, where it's moving the most, isn't it? That's correct, yes, indeed. And the wraparound windscreen is the new type of style? That's right, styling's right up to the minute. A reason of good height makes a nice blend uh, as the bimini canopy marries into it. You could, you, getting all your angles coming together in a pleasant way. Some of it can be done quite ugly. This one looks good. The Victorian climate lends itself to the clears. Some days are a bit warmer, some nights are a lot colder. Close it up when you want to, or just simply undo the zips. The side piece comes off, front piece comes off. It's one of those hot days. You've got the sunshade. They look good quality. That's good gear. Mm. One of the things I did notice about John, it's got a very unusual rear area at the bottom of the Transom. Okay, well, 
the beam in this boat's very generous, it's, uh, it's well proportioned and as we come out it's a 20 degree V, then we reach this reverse chine and the reverse chine is that downturn angle I'm showing you. This is responsible for giving a boat stability at rest as well as stability as it's travelling but more importantly it deflects the spray downwards particularly forward so you wind it with a very nice dry ride, an important feature in any boat's good design. And that would make it very easy to get up onto plane? Exactly, yes. I notice in this one you've got it fitted up with a 115 saltwater series two-stroke. Will it take a four-stroke and what range of engine should you use? Well the maximum recommendation on this one is 115 and that's quite okay for either, either two-stroke or four-stroke. The four-stroke weight's okay in this transom. The weight of the hull is 620 kilos so that sort of horsepower is going to ensure it performs very nicely as a fishing machine. This boat which is the 485 uh, Southern Star has a weight of about 600 kilograms. It's got a beam of 2.14 at the chine, so it's quite happy running uh, right through to 90 horsepower in a two-stroke or our smaller four-stroke engine. For the 485, what would its application suit? Family oh. day bow down? Well, again, it's like the uh, the 530 we've had a look at. It's a great family dual-purpose boat. You can ski with it, you can fish with it. It's got all the characteristics that make it a nice size boat. Fits in fits in very very well with our Victorian market. I feel. And it's fitted with most of those same features that the larger boat had. All the same thing we talked about in the other one, the seats, the lockers, the access forward. It's just like a baby boat to the 530, but real good value. I did notice that this one's fitted up with rod holders. Yes, rod holders are standard. Standard, good. Standard. John, you told us how Southern Star grew their roots from the old Southwind range of boats and Yamaha. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, basically what happened there, Steve, is that uh, Yamaha, the former owners of the business, sold out to a management buyout, uh, which is Noel Smith. And in the former days, the boats were only available through Yamaha dealers with Yamaha engines. Now Noel is assembling a dealer network across the country which can handle all brand outboards. So I feel that this might lead to a much more successful sale of the boat because they really do deserve more credit. They're a fabulously well-made hull. There's an extensive range. It comprises of nearly 20 models, all the way through to a, a large centre console, 7.7. .7. Many of you would remember the, what was nicknamed the banana boats. These were the original Japanese, uh, very high bow type of work boat. Yeah. They were very successful in the day and been em emulated by quite a few boat builders. But the range includes bow riders, serious fishing hulls like the ones we've seen today, and also family cruisers, bow riders. There's a whole range there and we hope to show you more as time goes by. John, in Victoria, in the southern states, we don't tend to go for the centre consoles. You, do you believe that the cuddy cabin is the best option? It is definitely. It's the sort of thing you've got some shelter to get behind on those cold nights when you're out on the snapper. The centre console just doesn't lend itself to these colder climates. OK. Well, we'll have to get you to give us a run in one of these as well sometime. We certainly will. Welcome to River to Reef, if you've just joined us. Tonight on the program we're going to have a look at an evil necessity. I speak of insurance. Now whether you own a car or a boat, most people will have an insurance policy. The marine industry may be a little bit different and we're going to find out how different and how it works. There's a couple of companies in Australia that specialise basically in marine insurance, that's all they do. Mark Cockford is our guest on River to Reef and he represents one of these companies. Welcome to River to Reef, Mark. We want to know all we can in a few minutes about marine insurance and how it works. Thanks, Glenn. Um, firstly, I want to talk to those people who don't have insurance, and, and they're the people that really we need to address. Um, not that we can force them to have insurance, but I'd really encourage all people um, to really think about at least having third-party legal liability cover. That's designed to cover that particular individual who owns a boat uh, for any damage that they might cause to a third party's boat or injury to a third party's person. That could happen, I can imagine, uh, on a, a quite a frequent basis uh, at launching ramps because you just never know when uh, you're going to give the boat beside you a nudge if you're not doing the, uh, the right thing in launching your boat. So very obviously very important, Mark. Yeah, there's been too many occasions in my boating career and insurance career Glenn, where you've seen people go out and um, enjoy a day boating, they come back in, uh, the wake of another boat, or strong winds push them onto another person's boat, where they damage the, the other person's boat, or someone gets injured, and all of a sudden uh, they're uh, exposed to the financial con consequences of repairing that other person's boat. So it's very important um, for people to have real peace of mind 
to invest uh, and you know for a level of even say something like two million dollars uh, coverage of um, third party only you know you're only talking about a hundred hundred twenty dollars uh, and that would give them peace of mind sure their boat might be of a value where they want to insure it uh, and they're quite happy to uh, cover the, the material damage to their boat themselves but I think it's very important that they've got to think about the exposure they have if they cause damage to someone else's property. Exactly. The other thing I'd like you to address, Mark, what um, parts of the boat, other than the hull and the structure of the boat, I mean, what about your fishing tackle, uh, your life jackets, uh, all the accessories, uh, your GPSs, your EPIRBs, that you would have on a boat, on, a, on an outrigged uh, sailing boat or a uh, outfitted fishing boat, do you have a comprehensive policy? Is there such a thing to cover all of that uh, in, in the one policy? Is that, is that how it happens? Yes, there is. And uh, under a comprehensive boat policy, you'll find that all your electronics are covered, your equipment and accessories. Uh, in some cases, you might have to note those items with your insurer. Um, but I'd always advise people, the best thing to do in regards to peace of mind uh, when it comes to the unfortunate situation where they do incur a loss through theft or accident and they have to make a claim that they have proof of ownership. So if uh, everyone with a boat, if I could recommend that you'd, you'd get your camera, your digital camera, uh, put all your electronics up on your dash, like your GPS, your fish finder, your, uh, your radio, uh, take some photographs of them, uh, then come back down towards your transom, shoot back forward into your boat. So you're showing everything that you carry on your boat as part of the setup of your boat. Uh, your fishing equipment, uh, your water ski equipment, and if you've got dive equipment, uh, lay them out next to your boat and take some comprehensive photographs of them. So in the event of a loss, the insurance company uh, will come to you and say, listen, we require you to provide proof of ownership. And what you can do then is produce these photographs that will be a comprehensive library of all the items that belong to your boat. Very good thinking. That's logic. That's practical. You know, your fishing rods, your pens, your Jarvis walkers, your Shimano's, all your gear, take photos of it because if it's part of your boat, uh, when it comes time to, uh, for the insurance company to pay up, you've got proof of what you've got. Excellent. Mark, thank you for uh, being part of River to Reef, and we'll talk on a future program, and uh, good insurancing. Thank you. <laughs>
Oh, there he is. Oh, we don't want to get in that net. <laughs> Wild Bill, he's having a day out. That's good fish. Hold it up, Billy. The Billy's on fire. Let's hit him. Yeah. Oh, something's taking a chunk out of him on the side of the... See that, Joel? Something's taking a chunk out of him. Oh, look at that. There's something bigger down there by the look of it. You can see how close we are into the, uh, the island here, the rocks. It's pretty dangerous. The skipper's got the motor running all the time. And he's keeping an eye out for any waves that are coming at us. But this is really good fun, the, the fish, when they hit. Gee. This uh, particular area where we're fishing at the moment, these are called the Page Islands. There's two islands, the, uh, the North and the South Island. And this is the uh, a large seal colony is here. And also the big great whites hang out here in large numbers. So uh, it's pretty treacherous water. A few boats have gone over and gone under here, as you can see with the, uh, the coverage of the swell. And it's a pretty, what we'd determine a calm day, but the swell here is massive. But uh, a seal colony, these are the Page Islands in uh, Jervis Bay. We're about oh, probably 10 or 12 mile out of the port. And as you see, the salmon here are very, very large and very, very tricky conditions. Lucky we're on a big boat and we've got a great skipper like Gary to look after us because this area, uh, skippering a boat in these waters is really not for the faint hearted. This could uh, get very critical at any time. So uh, we're lucky to have Gary doing what he's doing. Have we got our five pounder? That's the question we're asking everyone. I don't think so. I'm just get the fish on there. Okay. I'm going to, do, uh, I'm going to put it. Oh, it's good. Oh, look at the size of this whiting. I'm going to have to lift the rod. Oh, gee. Nice it's, whiting. He's probably around about 50 centimetres, I'd say, Billy. We're still chasing him. Yeah. But that's a. But yeah. Oh, that's always. a lovely whiting. Look at the size of him, mate. Look at that book. That's beautiful. Right. Absolutely gorgeous, eh? Hey, how good is this place, yeah. Phil? Mate, what do you reckon, eh? I look after his boys, don't I? Have yep. a look at him. We've just got a big cuttlefish. These are great whiting bait for over here. Nice. Ooh, 100 whiting will come out of that fish. Absolutely fantastic. That's an amazing looking creature, isn't have it? A of, have a little feature on it, guys. Just explain to some of the. That's, that, this viewers back at home here, you can listen to what I'm talking about at the moment. This is possibly the biggest cuttlefish I've ever seen in my whole life. I know we get him in Western Port and uh, Port Phillip Bay, but this is absolutely, absolutely fun. Have a little jaws on him. Is a big sucker tangle can there? It's not a starfish, this one, guys. Look at Gary, Gary's still playing with him. You've got to light him up again. Oh, oh here he goes. Look at that, eh? We came to South Australia to get big whiting. It's a long way from Melbourne, but this is the calibre of the fish we're getting. And uh, thanks to the skipper, Gary Lloyd, uh, cousin of Clive Lloyd, he's, uh, he's just done a fantastic job putting us on the big whiting. Fantastic. Look at that, huh? You could kiss that, couldn't you? But I'm not going to kiss it, I'm going to eat it. On bits and pieces this week, the producer Phil Harris has told me I've got 60 seconds to explain this wonderful product. Well here it is folks, it's a glow in the dark cutting board, bait board, but it's for use on the beach. It is from George Sant Marine, Bermuda Fishing Essentials, it's a little classic. Use it on the pier, you can sit it on a bucket, that grooves there, the groove that way or that way, it just sits beautifully on your bucket. It is sensational, to find out more, River to Reef website and click the Mercury link, but a sensational cutting board for the beach or for the pier. The dream of every boater is to own a wooden boat, but that dream can turn into a nightmare and the nightmare is caused by one word that's called rot. And we've got Adrian along again to go through all the pitfalls to look for when buying or maintaining a wooden boat. Adrian, I hope you've got some good advice for our viewers. Thank you very much for that, Tony. Uh, now, I'd just like to illustrate to you a few of the points to look for um, when you're looking at a, a plywood or bondwood boat. This is an example of an old bondwood boat that we're looking at here and uh, there's a few interesting points which I think is worthy of note that you should look out for. You can see here, for example, in this corner area here, 
that the, uh, the, uh, the plywood has been cut away to expose this open surface. Obviously someone's been, uh, there's some rot got into the boat here, possibly from the deck area up above. It has gone down and in fact the result of that is that it's rotted the whole side of the boat out. This has meant that all this plywood has had to be replaced. An extensive job. So one of the things you should look out for very carefully on a plywood boat is making sure that all the edges and the seams are intact so that water can't actually get in, particularly to the edge of the, of the plywood where it can run along and cause this type of damage. As we move along the boat, um, you can also see that uh, this, this, this is perfectly good solid wood here and all this has had to in fact be cut away simply to make the repair and will have to be replaced. So it's important that you make sure that all this plywood as you, as you look at your boat is in good condition. You can do that very easily. A simple tap with the end of the knuckles. When you find an area that suddenly sounds different, you'll know that maybe there's some rot behind there. That's the sort of thing that you need to look out for. Um, going a little bit further along the boat, if I can point up a little bit higher to the superstructure, to the side of the cabin here, you can see there again the results of rot. They're fairly obvious to pick up. They would have been hidden probably behind that window combing though. So you must be careful that you look in edges and corners, particularly where fresh water might have got in, because it's the fresh water that'll have a go at the, at the rot and, and cause the rot in the, in the plywood. Coming along down a little bit further down the boat, uh, gradually coming along here, again, there's another area being exposed here. Uh, and underneath here, you can see the underlying structure of this part of the boat with the screws and nails that have been used to hold it together. This wood here is not in bad condition, but obviously the plywood has become rotten in this area and has had to be chipped away. It's exposed what's underneath and it looks to me like this has probably got a few problems, may need to be some replacing of the underlying wood. If that's the case, it could be an extensive job to do this. So pay particular attention with these plywood and bondwood boats to the edges, the corners, any seams, and particularly if water can get into the end of the plywood because that's where the rot will be caused. So I hope that gives you uh, some idea of, of some of the points to look out for, particularly when you're looking at one of these plywood or bondwood boats. Thanks Adrian, some great advice on what to look for when buying or maintaining a wooden boat. Over the last few weeks, we've looked at fiberglass and also aluminium as well. But if you're still not sure and want to find out some more information on the construction of boats, contact Marine Safety Victoria via our website or give us a call. You can also get a vessel surveyor to come out and give your boat an appraisal. Competition time on River to Reef and something entirely different this time. Up for grabs is the Z650 Kodak digital camera and docking station. And to be in the prize draw, send us a photo, a fishy photo, any fishy photo. Name, address, telephone number on the back of the photo and post it to the address on your screen now and somebody is going to win that magic digital camera from Kodak. It's that simple, so go to it. Let's get those photos in. Well, folks, that's our show for tonight. River to Reef, next week, another beauty in the can, as they say. We take you back to Cape Jervis on search for the big snapper. We get a few too, I can assure you. The Marine Safety Victoria boys will be along, and Mick Katamati takes us through a beautiful seafood recipe. And of course, our Kodak competition, all on next week's program. And don't forget, if you want some more fishing, join the crew every Saturday morning between 5 and 8 on SEN. It's a lot of fun. See you then. Have a great week. So if I haven't turned up Monday and the boss is pretty dim, I've been away the whole weekend and the wife says I'll kill him. If my mobile doesn't answer, tell them she'll be right, Chief. I'm just lost between the river and the reef. You'll find me between the river and the reef.